Well, the first four weeks of the college football season in the rear view, and several young signal callers have met or even exceeded expectations, just as others might have missed the mark as well as their starting jobs. And we now welcome in CBS Sports College football writer Tom Fernelli, who has been following along closely with the production of these young college signal callers, so much so that you can catch his weekly quarterback power rankings that drops every Wednesday. But Tom, we're lucky here because since I've got you today, maybe we can get a bit of a peek into what to expect ahead of tomorrow's drop. So I want to start with your QB riser, whose performance has made a noticeable jump in your rankings. Yeah, the biggest riser in the rankings this week is none other than Shador Sanders, who comes back into the rankings after falling out after the loss to Nebraska a couple weeks ago because one of the rules of my quarterback power rankings is if you lose, you get dropped out no matter what. So after having two very strong performances the last two weeks against Colorado State and Baylor, he's back in. He's at number five. Typically throw it for 651 yards and six touchdowns in two games. I'll do that. But more than anything, it's that play you just saw. It's the Hail Mary is obviously a huge deal to force overtime in the game, but it's the fact that Shador was rolling to his left, throwing back across his body while under pressure and was able to make that throw. I mean, I don't know if he didn't have to do anything else. Just that one throw was probably enough to get him back in the rankings this week. Every time I see that play or just another angle of it, I, I kind of question, I don't know what is better because you talk about that throw, but then also the catch, it still plays in my mind. Impressive nonetheless from Sanders. Mm -hmm. But on the opposite end, Tom, you know, we got to talk about who's fallen. So who's dropped a bit in your rankings after week four? Yeah, you know, last week I had a little fun with the rankings. Quinn Ewers gets hurt. He was at number one. And, of course, everybody knows who Quinn Ewers' backup was. It was Arch Manning. He was the talk of the college football universe. So I figured if he could back up Quinn in real life, I would have him back him up in the power rankings. So I threw him at number one. But uh, he's he's not in the rankings this week. His first start did not go very well. I mean, the Texas Longhorns did win against Louisiana Monroe. But if you look at Arch's numbers, he barely completed over half of his passes. He did have two touchdowns, but he also had two interceptions. It was not quite as nice as the UTSA debut was, but I still think in the long run, Arch Manning is going to be a very good quarterback for the Texas Longhorns, and I just think that, you know, after that one, had to remove him from the rankings. Ah, uh, brutal outing. I mean, it's still getting that 51-3 to victory, but not enough to maintain number one in your rankings, Tom. Meanwhile, well, it was a poor performance that led to a quarterback change for the Sooners. Brett Venables handing that offense now to Michael Hawkins Jr. after Jackson Arnold committed three turnovers and the Sooners lost to Tennessee. It's almost like Hawkins instantly sparked that offense or perhaps maybe the Vols defense didn't really know how to respond, but leading Oklahoma to two fourth quarter touchdown drives. What changes does he bring to the Sooners offense now that he's the starting quarterback? You know, there there has been buzz around Norman ever since the summer and into fall camp about how well this kid had been performing in practice, and they felt like they'd kind of hit a home run by getting him in that uniform. But, of course, Jackson Arnold was going to go into the season as a starter. It's one of the reasons Dylan Gabriel decided to move on and go to Oregon, and Jackson Arnold himself was a very highly touted recruit. It's just that in this offense, Oklahoma has had real difficulty along the offensive line all season. And while Jackson Arnold is not what you would consider to be a stat at you back there. He is not the most mobile quarterback in the country. He can move around a bit, but he's not somebody who's looking to run. With Hawkins, the hope is that his mobility behind an offensive line that struggled to block will give them more of a fighting chance because if you look at that game against Tennessee, you can argue that they will not face a defensive front for the rest of the season as good as the one that they got in the Volunteers, but you can also see by these highlights when he did get pressured, he was able to make something happen, whether it was picking up first downs to extend drives or just getting rid of the ball and getting, you know, a few yards here and there. And that is something that Jackson Arnold had really kind of struggled with. So they're hoping that Hawkins, when he takes over this week, when things don't go according to plan, he will perform better than Arnold has been, which in turn would give the Sooners a better chance to win games. But again, the quarterback change is what they're doing. I don't know if quarterback is the biggest problem that the Sooners have had. I just think that they're hoping this will fix a few things. But defensively, they're so good that they might not need their quarterback to do too much to keep winning games. Perhaps it's putting a Band-Aid on a massive league. But like you said, the defense maybe might not even need that 
extremely, you know, out there, incredible per quarterback performance, just considering their defense. I got to ask you one more, Tom. I mean, are there, with this coming out on uh, Wednesday, any fan base is going to be uh, tweeting at you very unhappy? I'm kind of looking at K-State a little bit. Yeah, uh, Avery Johnson. I mean, they'll be unhappy with me, but they should be more unhappy with Avery Johnson. <laughs> if you look at what Kansas State did on Saturday night at BYU, he had a very poor performance. A week after he helped lead them to a big win over Arizona, he went on the road. And listen, Provo is a difficult place to play, especially at night. Those fans are loud. They are raucous. They can really get into your head. And they got into Avery Johnson's head. He made a lot of bad decisions through a couple interceptions, put the, put the Wildcats in a bad Bad spot and things just kind of avalanche. So now Kansas State's a team that you were looking at a couple weeks ago as a real contender in the Big 12. They still have the chance to do that. It's just that's not a game that they were expected to lose. So they've kind of put themselves in a hole where they can't really afford to make too many more mistakes because they've got a lot of tough games remaining on the schedule. And Avery Johnson, he's going to need to play a lot better than he did in Provo the rest of the way out if this Wildcats team wants to win the Big 12. Yeah, don't come after the messenger or messengers. I think you got someone else to uh, look towards if you're K-State fans. But, Tom, as always, we appreciate you stopping by. and Make sure you check out that article dropping on a Wednesday on CBSSports.com. Thanks, Tom. And if you want more where that came from, well, you're going to want to check out the Cover 3 podcast where Tom's joined by Chip Patterson, Danny Cannell, and Bud Elliott with in-depth analysis and insider insight ahead of each weekend to take you to the natty and beyond. Download and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.